This week, we're talking about the fate of the Knights Templar. What happened in 1129 CE and then in 1307? We'll follow this up with a look at a group that came before the Knight Templar, the Cathars. And then we will follow it up with a piece on the Merovingians. In a three-part series composed by Kristen Wilson Slack, she explores all three of these groups and the connections they may or may not have to Freemasonry and their influence in the world today. Finally, we'll wrap it up with the qualities associated with independence, judgment in unbiased ways, and direct communication. All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 551. I want to thank the supporters of the show, our contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners for helping bring this podcast to everyone interested in Freemasonry since July of 2011. Almost 10 years of Masonic education, all the episodes available all the time for everyone. All thanks to them. If you're curious on how to help the WCY podcast bring quality Masonic education to the masses worldwide, go to WCYpodcast.com, click on support the show, and see how you can assist. If donations aren't your thing, we do also have a limited edition shop as well as a bookstore. The bookstore, of course, everything comes from Amazon.com. We are an affiliate, and a few pennies from every sale comes back to this program. It doesn't cost you any extra, but it helps us out. So thanks in advance. Now this week, we want to get right into the Masonic education. So quickly, I want to mention just a couple things. Number one, please get your tickets for the South Pasadena Masonic Con event happening at MasonicCon.com. Your pre-sale... Tickets are on sale right now, and those are going to be discounted pretty heavily. Virtual pass is discounted $8, and all access pass is discounted $31, and the executive pass is saving you $25. Check out the tickets which are on sale right now. There are several speakers, panels, screenings, vendors, and a festive board, which are all going to be things that go down in history. Now, if traveling to California is not your thing, you can always check out Masonic Con Kansas. This will be an epic event bringing the Masonic Con experience once more to the Midwest. This will be on August 27th, so at the end of August. The South Pasadena Masonic Con in California is at the mid to end of July. But MasonicCon Kansas, if you head to MasonicConKansas.com, you'll have links to that in the show notes as well as SPML's event. Again, a number of great speakers, panels, and an amazing festive board as well. It's the MasonicCon season. I hope to see you at one of those two events. I'll be at both of them, and I'm really looking forward to it. All right, let's get into this week's Masonic Education. Now, the first piece I wanted to go into is that it's actually a three-part series that had different titles that Kristen Wilson Slack wrote over at the Masonic Philosophical Society.com and uh, it is a wonderful series of articles that explores the historicity of groups that are related throughout history and have connections to masonry maybe. First up, The Templar Fate, a primer by Kristen Wilson Slack, published January 21st, 2019. On Friday, October 13, 1307, the French king Philip IV, the Fair, arrested and charged with heresy the various knights, monks, and households of the Knights Templar, in defiance of the then-current Pope Boniface VIII's authority. Thus begins the most famous or infamous, depending on your belief, trial of medieval times, the trial of the Knights Templar, or the poor fellow soldiers of Jesus Christ. The order of the Knights Templar was beholden only to the Pope, as was set out in their formal inception as a military sacred order in 1129 CE, or Common Era. At the Council of Troyes, the Knights had a strict rule of order written by St. Bernard of Clairvaux, emphasizing chastity, obedience, and poverty. Originally charged with guarding the pilgrims who came to a newly won Christian Jerusalem, 
the Knights performed further duties over the course of their approximately 190 years of existence. They fought in the Crusades, took in younger sons of nobles and trained them in monastic and chivalric duties, and acted as monetary brokers to the pilgrims. Due to the interest in securing the Holy Land for pure Christian purposes, many European nobles and royalty gave large sums of money, younger sons, and land to the order, who also acted as bankers for several members of royalty. At the time of their arrest, the Templars were one of the richest organizations in Christendom. They were money changers and deposit bankers, one of the largest religiously sanctioned banking functions in the Middle Ages. Being beholden to the Pope, and only the Pope, did not hurt their lofty status. They were answerable to no king or duke, ostensibly working for all of the Christian faith. That is, they had little temporal control over their comings and goings. This apparent secrecy hurt them in the end, as false charges were difficult to disprove. Yet, their status as protectors of pilgrims never wavered, even when the Crusades were beginning to fail. As Christians lost control of the Holy Land to other religions, the Templars pulled back their protection efforts, yet still retained their status as bankers and pious warrior monks. This was a group that did not know how to reinvent itself. Indeed, their last Grand Master, Jacques de Molay, was seen as both pious and inefficient. Lacking vision, the Grand Master pushed for a new crusade as their original charter dictated, perhaps to the Order's detriment. There was tremendous political upheaval within the Catholic Church, and this entered the period of the French papacy, puppets of the French royalty. There are some scholars who believe the Knights Templar lost their humility and shifted the way of the powerfully rich, feeling that money and their connection to the Pope would save them from all political or temporal concerns. In the end, we have to rely on contemporary reviews of medieval writings from everyone but the Templars on their motivations and defense. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of contemporary writings about the Knights Templar, with nearly as many theories of why and what. Grand schemes involving treasures and magic have surfaced with little substantiation behind them. The truth can be found, we hope, in the primary resources and period writings, at least in part. From his book, Trial of the Templars, Malcolm Barber seeks to lay out how the Templars met their downfall. From the introductory material we read, quote, The Templars fought against Islam and the Crusader East for nearly two centuries. During that time, the original small band grew into a formidable army, backed by an extensive network of preceptories in the Latin West. In October 1307, the members of this seemingly invulnerable and respected order were arrested on the orders of Philip IV, King of France, and charged with serious heresies including the denial of Christ, homosexuality, and idol worship. The ensuing proceedings lasted for almost five years and culminated in the suppression of the order. The motivations of the participants and long-term repercussions of the trial have been the subject of intense and unresolved controversy, which still has resonance in our own time. Barber first published his book in 1978 with a second edition in 2006, one year before the Vatican released the official documents they had on the Templar trials. More on this below. Barber endeavors to explain, in clear terms, what was going through the minds of the main players of the story. For those who are interested in scholarly rather than sensational approach to the story, this is the go-to accessible book. You can download a copy from academia.edu. Much of the downfall of the Templars, their secrets, are very fanciful ideas with no supporting evidence. Sensationalized by the Da Vinci Code, among other media, the facts regarding who the Templars were, what they achieved, and what ultimately led to their downfall have been somewhat lost. As to the reason for the arrests and trial, two theories reign. The first is that the Templars were arrested on the charge of heresy, as that is the only charge that could force the organization to deliver all its material wealth to the regional authorities. In this case, Philip IV in France. Philip was broke after having seized monies from all of his available sources, and this source, the Knights Templar, were the last richest group he could possibly tap. Having some control over the Pope afforded Philip the ability to take the step of arrest without the Pope's approval. 
The Pope attempted to control the situation by issuing the arrest warrants for all Templars throughout Christendom and forced the trials to be run by the papacy rather than the regional monarchs. This did little to help the order survive as the defaming, true or not, caused a general apathy toward the original goal of the Knights Templar. The second theory for the arrest is slightly less supported, although also possible. In this second theory, Philip was being fed information about the Templars' heresy by French members of the order. Philip was known as a devoted Catholic and husband, and when his wife died, he turned his bitterness into hate for the Templars. Supposed heresy. In this single-minded desire to rid France of all things unchristian, he issued the arrest for what he deemed to be a heretical group living in his domain, a reason for God to punish his household and kingdom. Whether money factored into this decision or not is not known. Ultimately, we only have the few written documents of the time to try to suss out what really happened. Barber's conclusion is that whatever the reason for the arrests and subsequent trial, the forces which brought down the Knights Templar were external, not a glaring internal insufficiency. For people who are really interested in how the Templars began, a copy of the work of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, The Rule of the Knights Templar, can be had from your bookseller. St. Bernard was a leading theologian of his time, attending popes and royalty alike. His rule came out of the work he did in the Council of Troy, and became the ideal of the chivalric orders. The book is a dry read, but it does outline what it meant to be a warrior and a monk, a new professional and religious vocational in medieval society. Another book written by Bernard and edited by historian Malcolm Barber is In Praise of the New Knighthood, a treatise on the Knights Templar and the Places of the Holy Land. In this second book, St. Bernard gives us an expose on the ideals of the warrior monk life and how this new medieval knight serves the greater good. In early 2007, the Vatican announced that the papers regarding the trial of the Templars had been found. And in October of that same year, they published 799 copies of The Process Against the Templars. In this book are contained copies of the original manuscripts and papal bulls, decrees, and transcripts of everything the Church would allow published of the Templar trial. It can still be found for sale at prohibitive sums. It would be a good, solid read for any true scholar of the Templars if it could be found available to the public. One can hope that the Vatican someday releases it to a far wider audience. Some scholars on academia.edu's reference site have placed papers about the Templars, some of them referencing this Vatican book, including one treatise on the Chinon parchment, the written conclusion of absolution of the charges of heresy against the order written by the then-Pope Clement V, and the College of Cardinals. Quote, the document contains the absolution Pope Clement V gave to the Grand Master of the Temple, Friar Jacques de Molay, and to the other heads of the order, after they had shown to be represented and asked to be forgiven by the Church after the formal abjuration, which is compelling for all those who were even only suspected of heretical crimes. The leading members of the Templar Order are reinstated in the Catholic Communion and readmitted to receive the sacraments." End quote. What began in glory ended in sadness and death. The rule of the Order and many of the moral tenets live on today in Freemasonry, if perhaps a shadow of what they were. Freemasons endeavor to lead a nobly simple life, focusing on service rather than reward. Additionally, there are groups of Freemasons who participate in rituals dedicated to the Knights Templar and continue to work toward the ideals of the original Templars. For hundreds of years, the Knights Templars seem to be a shamed group, shrouded in mystery and falsehood. Now, after 700 years, the Order of the Templars are absolved of their heresy and can rest an eternal, peaceful sleep of justice. All right, a pretty fascinating look. I like that she left it kind of open for interpretation on some elements here in relation to the Masonic connection. Next up in this series, we move on to another article published by Kristen Wilson Slack on February 21st, 2019, entitled, Who Were the Cathars? Whenever the Templars are mentioned, the Cathars are generally not far behind. Tied together with some interesting data and facts, 
they tend to be the focus of intense, esoteric, and mystical knowledge. Taking a look at them with the facts we have may answer questions or create deeper ones. The Cathars were the followers of a 12th to 14th CE Gnostic movement in southern France and Italy. This movement, Catharism, comes from the Greek word katharoi, or pure ones. Scholars agree that the people who practiced this religion did not call themselves by this name. In all honesty, it seems unclear what they did call themselves except the good Christians. The movement first took hold in the small town of Albi in France. And the followers were also known as the Albigensians, especially to the Catholics. The ideas of Catharism were around for centuries before this larger movement took place and possibly has its roots in what is called Policianism. In the Policianism belief system, the adherents do not believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in fact believe that Jesus was adopted by God to be his quote-unquote son and endure the necessary trials. Policianism was vibrant around the 7th to 9th century CE, particularly in Armenia. Cathars, like the Paulicians, primarily believed in a dualistic Christian system, wherein there were two gods, one good, one evil, as well as deeper Gnostic concepts. The basic tenets of the Cathar religion seem to have come from a single priest, Bogomil, during the First Bulgarian Empire in the 10th century CE as a response to the rise of feudalism. In other words, the oppression and slavery of feudalistic ideas spurred this priest and his followers toward a mindset of individual free will and worth. Like later Cathars, Bogomilism did not believe in the ecclesiastical hierarchy, nor did they believe in the need for church buildings. In a sense, Bogomils and then Cathars were an itinerant religion spread by men and women of the church elite, travelers. Most of their beliefs were radical to a still struggling Catholic church, and in a time prior to Luther, Catholic ideas were the only Christian meal to be had. The church had struggled for over a thousand years to get itself right, and it did not need yet one more renegade group to get in its way. Cathars believed in reincarnation of humans and animals and did not eat the flesh of animals for this reason. They had a vibrant tradition in their troubadours and were traveling craftsmen of many trades. Many men and women were mainly seen as equals, although it is thought that their last incarnation needed to be male in order to be close to God. Their good God was the creator of all that was spiritual, ethereal, and thought while the evil god was the creator of all that was material. They did not believe in hell, it being the earth in which we currently live, but heaven was populated by angels and spirits, performing the will of the good god. By living their aesthetic life, they believed themselves to be the truest Christians, where the Catholic Church was a corruption of all of the Christian teachings. Cathars had two levels of knowledge, for lack of a better term, to distinguish the teachers from the lay follower, known as perfects or parfaits. Both men and women could become one of the elites and were both known to travel and spread the doctrine. This seems to mimic some of the early Christian sects who also adopted from the cult of Mithras, Bacchus, and a few other mystery schools. What is important to note is that for the first 500 to seven years of its life, Christianity was nowhere near the juggernaut that it became in the 14th to 19th centuries. Out of the remains of the Roman Empire, the Catholic Church rose to reinvent itself to be that empire once again, using religion instead of soldiers to find its way. There was not just one Council of Nicaea, but seven over the course of 400 years. The doctrine of the Church was not set in stone, more like several tributaries that were flowing to a single great river. It took hundreds of years and thousands of theological discussions to get where it is today, still fragmented but fairly solid. It is in the period of the Bogomils and the Cathars that we see the Catholic Church coming into its own power and asserting its right as the divine authority over laymen and royalty alike all through Western Europe. It is also important to remember that this was a time before Luther, before the idea that the human could come to God in other ways and not via their connection to a priest, 
At this time, the spiritual afterlife of every person lay in the hands of the Catholic Church. Clearly, the Catholic Church had money and royalty. There was not much that was going to get in the way of it becoming the dominant force in Western Europe. In fact, many new ideas of suppression were tried on the Cathars. Tools. The Catholic Church would further expand as it moved through Europe imposing its will. The Catholic Church did see the Cathars as a heretical sect, yet they debated whether they were even Christians. Either way, they could not survive. In 1208, Pope Innocent III declared a crusade on the Albigensian region of Languedoc, which was not part of France at the time, but its own kingdom. Known as the Albigensian Crusade, or later by the name of the Cathar Wars, the killing of human beings was indiscriminate. Many Catholics, Jews, and Cathars died in these wars. This genocide bred the first use of the now common phrase, kill them all, God will know his own. This was the first time a crusade had been waged within the confines of conventional Western Europe, and by all accounts, the Catholic Church called it a success. This was followed by what would be called the First Inquisition, whereupon torture and death were used to force conversion back to the true religion, Catholicism. The crusade itself was ended in 1244, the date when the castle at Montségur fell to the crusaders. The Inquisition continued well into the 14th century. The last known Cathar elite, called Perfect, as was their custom, was burned there in 1321 CE. Cathars did continue to exist in hiding, and by all accounts had eventually died off as a continuing sect. There are some who believe that elements of the Cathar religion rose with Luther and Protestantism, but there are no real supporting documents or links to this supposition. Additionally, there was and is a supposition that the Cathars held a secret treasure, which was spirited away prior to the fall of Montségur. No evidence has been found of this treasure, although some believe it is knowledge rather than an actual treasure. There is also an idea that this treasure went to the Knights Templar, who were just being formed. Indeed, the one link between the Templars and the Cathars was Bernard of Clairvaux, later Saint Bernard. Bernard is seen to have held some of the same ideas of the Cathars, even if he did see them as heretics to be eradicated. He had continued correspondence with the Bishop of the Cathars, and indeed visited. Bernard was also prominent in bringing the worship of the Virgin Mary to popularity, which was in keeping with Cathar beliefs. The Cathars were and are an interesting offshoot of the Christian religion from its earliest days, and it is a shame that not more of its own writings exist. Many have speculated if the Cathars still exist, and if so, in what form. It may just be a single, dead branch of a tree that has its roots in a far older and mysterious teaching. There are a few books about the Cathars. The one by Malcolm Barber, who was also about the Templars, is interesting and factual. There also is another book about a woman who remembers her past life as a Cathar in the 13th century titled The Cathars and Reincarnation by Arthur Gerdhan. It is relatively short with some descriptions of places and drawings associated with them. It is an entertaining read, and we'll leave it up to the reader to validate their own beliefs about the teller's story. There is also a very thorough website, which has a lot of great references for anyone who wants to know more. And for the third piece, let's just get right into it because it ties right into the same thread. And this is the third part from Kristen Wilson Slack published February 24th, 2019, and this is called The Merovingians. Here we go. This is the third of a rambling three-part exploration of Middle and Dark Age Europe, birthplace of much myth concerning Western religious and esoteric teachings. Never was myth and make-believe more true than with the Merovingians. There is a pain over my left eye when people talk about how the Merovingians were the descendants of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. It begins as somewhat of a sinus headache, moving into a full-blown brain burn as the person goes on about how it was possible and descendants of Christ are alive and well and are French. They go about this by trying the fish symbology the early Christians to the name of Merovech or Vec, assumed founder of the Merovingian dynasty. Thanks, Dan Brown and Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas. 
In my younger days, I too went down this path of how history gets corrupted by pop culture and fell down a deep rabbit hole researching the Knights Templar. Inevitably, this led me to the Cathars and the Merovingians, Lomas and Knight, and yes, I was a swirling mess of mythology, masquerading as fiction, masquerading as fact. Of course, it could have happened. Of course, it's right here on the internet. I finally grew up after a few smackings from real historians and got on the bandwagon of facts. Like a reformed smoker, I went whole hog into finding out true history. My library is a testament to finding a glimmering moment of fact amongst the ashes of primary sources. Primary sources and logical research are the key words everyone who wants to know about history should revere. The sensational is fun, but it clearly and certainly isn't always, maybe usually, true. Another historian and researcher taught me early on that quote-unquote real history is generally way more interesting than what people make up, and he was right. With the Merovingians, the history is nowhere near as exciting as most people think. The founder of the dynasty was Merovech, or Vec, whence the name Merovingians emerges. Merovech was the first to unite the barbarian Franks into a kingdom commonly known as Francia, later France. The Franks were, up until this time, a loose confederation of different tribes, warring as the Roman Empire fell apart. Around 458, Merovech's son, Childric I successfully won grand against the Visigoths, Saxons, and Germanic tribes to unite the Franks into a common cause. However, it was his son Clovis I who united most of the northern Franks into a single kingdom to battle against the remaining Romans and Germanic tribes to form Francia. The dynasty continued for 300 years when they finally succumbed to the inter-kingdom strife, the influence of the Christian Pope and personal feuds, it wasn't a particularly glorious end to a long ruling empire, it was more a very human one. Many people believe that the beginnings of the country of France began with Clovis uniting all the different Frankish tribes under his rule and he set the tone for how the future of France would evolve. Hence the Merovingian dynasty has a place in the heart of the modern French psyche. It's no wonder that a strong late 20th century mythology built on a hoax would stir the French as well as the rest of the world. Pierre Plantard in the mid-20th century CE created a hoax which involved forged documents, a secret of regal lineage and co-conspirators that would make even the best con man proud. Over the course of 30 plus years, Plantard promoted an organization named the Priory of Sion, purported to have created the Templars, discovered hidden documents found in rennes le chateau proving the bloodline of the Christ, which was Merovingian among other things. The entire setup was an elaborate hoax that perpetuated until the late 1990s when the entire fraud was brought to light. Not before, however, several quote-unquote historians, fiction writers, and even 60 Minutes were dragged into strengthening this mythology. Books like Holy Blood, Holy Grail, The Da Vinci Code have perpetuated and sensationalized the stories until the claims have become a little insane. Ren le Chateau was in the heart of the Cathar territory and claims about the Church of Mary Magdalene increased the myth. As we discussed previously, the Cathars revered Mary Magdalene, so it is no surprise that there is a church in her honor in the Cathar homeland. By tying the mythology of the Merovingian fish, an elaborate birth tale of the Merovich's parents being part woman and part sea god, the idea was this must be a secret message that the Merovingians were tied to the lineage of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, who brought herself and Christ's unborn child to France when Jesus was killed. You add to this the spice that Mary must have carried the Holy Grail or that she was the Holy Grail, sprinkle it with a few false documents and true biblical references and you have the makings of a great feast of fiction and conspiracy theory. Killjoy, I hear you say. Let's just say, I think the facts make a much better story. We don't need to sensationalize to get a good dose of interesting intrigue and human strife, tragedy, and hope. The Merovingians were an interesting story unto themselves, having been really the first rulers of a modern France. They established cultural identity that lives to this day and can be seen in the remnants of laws, moors, architecture, and language. They established a rule that was the precursor to feudalism and were strong supporters of the early and medieval Catholic Church. Dozens of Merovingians were prominent church leaders and saints. The Merovingians were the seeds of a long and deep nationalism that affects world thought today. This is why they are really to be remembered and discussed. 
Freemasons search for truth in their own origins. I would think they would search hardest. There are elements of the Knights Templar, the Cathars, and even the Merovingians in the foundation stones of Freemasonry. How could there not be? These were groups whose ideas and ideals were radical for their time. Groups of people who formed new ways of being and thinking in their time periods. From the early 5th century all the way through the late Middle Ages, rebels, mold breakers, liberators. For people who are themselves trying to change the world for better, I can't really think of better icons. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Colton. Well, there you've got these three pieces by Kristen Wilson Slack. I thought the ending uh, piece on the Merovingians and some of the lore that's attached to this, as well as the pop culture references from Dan Brown and, of course, uh, Knight and Lomas and Holy Blood, Holy Grail. All of that was fantastic. You know, I really like Holy Blood, Holy Grail. I think that's a really cool book. And I also like another book that I think Bages wrote called The Jesus Papers. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Whether factual or not, uh, I thought it was entertaining read. Now, for the Craftsman Plus out there, I want to ask a question. Now, these three pieces have largely focused around Christian and Gnostic lore. And while I find this fascinating and the different things associated with, I'm curious uh, what you all have a interest in when it comes to a religious piece of lore, whether that's Christian, Muslim, Judaism, or Buddhism, or some kind of really interesting comparative thing that's not unlike some of the Gnostic Christian lore that's been perpetuated through, you know, either pop culture or other modes? Is there some sort of secret Buddhist code or are, are there hollows from your religion that people have written about? I'd love to hear any of those things and for no other reason than my intense curiosity that I might look into them myself and find them fascinating. And maybe we can talk about those on future episodes. So if you've got anything or anything interests you or you want to know anything more about some of this, hit it up in the Craftsman Plus group and let me know what you think. All right, now we're going to get into this week's tarot card draw, the random tarot card draw, which we're doing every week. If you want to know more about the tarot and uh, see some cool reviews on different tarot decks and things, Feel free to follow on TikTok. Uh, I'm under the Wizard of Arj, A-R-J, and I just do a lot of tarot stuff there. If you're interested in tarot readings, all of that kind of thing, it can be found at wcypodcast.com slash tarot. But anyway, so what does tarot have to do with Freemasonry? I say it every week. I am always going to point this out uh, as part of a disclaimer. Tarot has nothing to do with Freemasonry at all. However, the tarot, the way I'm using it, is no different than, say, a working tool in Freemasonry. I take a card, we look at the prescribed meaning of the specific deck that we are looking at, as well as a more broad meaning that is assigned to the cards in general, and then finally a contemporary look and really what that does for us in terms of bettering ourselves. So how can we uh, use this not unlike our working tools, a common gavel or something in our day-to-day -day lives. And we'll try to even look at it from a Masonic context. So all I'm going to do is grab a specific deck. I will shuffle. I'll draw one card and we'll talk about it and see what it holds for us. So let me go ahead and do that now. Now this week I'm going to be using a deck that I reviewed on the TikTok channel. I think it might be on Instagram also. And if it's on Instagram, that means it's also on Facebook somewhere. Uh, this is the Antique Anatomy Tarot. I fell in love with this. It's by Claire Goodchild. I fell in love with her uh, cards just because I liked her artwork. But you know, it is a standard 78 card deck. Card weights are nice. So I'm just going to give these things a quick shuffle. No particular way to do that. I've already given you my take that several times over that I don't have any specific way I shuffle. I just shuffle. Think about my question sometimes, if I have one, but this time no question, just trying to keep a blank slate in my head as I draw the card. I don't want to input uh, any personal thoughts. Well, if I do, it's, it's kind of inevitable, but I uh, try to keep it as neutral as possible for the people who are listening in the car, at home, wherever. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to take, I'm going to fan these out and just grab 
a random one, maybe toward the last third of the deck here. Just I'll slide one card out, I'll set it down. I'm gonna close the rest of them, put it back in my box. All right, let's see what we get. I'm gonna flip it over. I have the Queen of Blades. What is that? Now, normally in a tarot deck, you have four suits, which would be pentacles, wands, swords, and cups. So, blades, that throws us off. What could blades be? What's the suit of blades? A lot of times what happens is somebody will use a different iconography with the same type of meaning, if that makes sense. So, for the Antique Anatomy Tarot, I will consult the guidebook by Claire Goodchild. So, with Claire's deck here, she's using the suit of elixirs, which I will assume will be cups, rods, which will be wands or rods, coins, which is pentacles, and blades, which is swords. So in this instance, we're getting the Queen of Swords. So direct from her guidebook, in terms of the keywords here, things that this card should invoke when you think about it, are things like observant. So being able to notice things, detail-oriented maybe, being strong and independent, critical and sarcastic. Wow. So it says, as a situation, this card wants you to find the way without help from others, indicating a time of independence. You have the skills and information you need, and now is the time to put it all together. Rational thought trumps emotional, hot-headedness, and being aloof allows your judgment to be clear. So that's an interesting take on the card. Now the card itself, the iconography that it displays, I'll have a picture for you in the Craftsman Plus group and a link for anybody who is interested in picking up this particular deck. But I will say that it is a sword or a knife that is being plunged from the under part of the jaw through the top of the skull. And uh, it is an image of an, an anatomical skull with uh, a bouquet of flowers around it. Now typically, this card shows a woman uh, holding a sword upright with her right hand, the sword pointing to the sky. She's on a throne. Sometimes the throne is uh, representative of a large vessel or cup. There are clouds in the background sometimes. And, and also she's holding out her left hand as if to take something or make an offering or something along those lines. She's facing uh, toward the future, right? With Again, with her left hand raised as if to take something. Maybe she's giving, but it's likely that she's receiving. And as in things like justice, when you see the sword and the justice, this is the Queen of Swords representing truth in all things. Now, this card, when you draw it, moving into a more contemporary view, uh, and what I mean by contemporary is a, a more modern take on this in plain English without the ethereal kind of baloney that you might read in other places. Like you could read a whole lot of things about it and go, how does this even make any sense for me? So that's what we try to do here to shed a little bit of light on this. So just in the hopes that we can assist our own minds in thinking about how we do things so that we can become better and more emotionally adjusted with ourselves, the world, and the people we deal with right? We want to be better people. So this is just a, another tool in the arsenal. And then when we finish talking about this contemporary meaning, let's touch on some of the Masonic elements and how this might apply in Freemasonry. So the Queen of Swords combines a couple of things. We've dealt with cards that have done this before, but in this instance, we're looking at mental force or maybe even clearness, clear thoughts about something, and also the power of your intellect because swords deals with intellect. Because you have a queen, uh, it's higher on the rank than say a page or a squire or a knight. This means there is some air of maturation to the card. You are a little bit older, a little bit wiser, a little bit slower in your approach, a little more considerate in your approach to the truth. But you're also open, flexible. You can hear both sides of a story. Not like, not unlike, you know, Stay, you know, if you've got kids and you might hear from two of your children, you're listening to both things, both sides. If you're a worshipful master, you're listening to both sides before coming to your decision. Trying to 
better figure these things out without allowing your mind to be made up via emotions or even what we would call sentimentality. So if you have sentimental value to something. Also because it's a queen, we're dealing with things like empathy and compassion. But in this instance, because we're dealing with intellect, this reminds us not to use those two things. We want just the truth, nothing but the truth. Insert the old Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth meme here, perhaps. But again, this card represents connecting on an intellectual level rather than an emotional one. It speaks to the idea that you are looking for truth. You want to hear the thoughts and opinions, but eventually you're going to filter all of the information that you've taken and throw away what you don't want, keep what you do, and end up with the pure info. It also means that sometimes people might be off put by you because you will tell things like they are. You're a straight shooter. They respect your opinion and they come to you for advice, but also they know what to expect from you. A no BS approach, perhaps. And lastly, you're looking at a card that represents some sort of independence. You appear as somebody who has grit and this is all good. So Masonically speaking, this is very uh, Masonic because it's telling us to look for the truth, to search for the absolute truth, so the capital T. And certainly we get there through using the four cardinal virtues, which justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. We can use those four cardinal virtues to help us extract some of the meaning of this particular card. And of those four cardinal virtues, you want to look at that justice card. Because that justice card is really what you're finding the correlation to in this particular card. That's it for this week. I want to thank you all for joining me on this edifying journey. I hope to hear from you and we will talk to you all next week. Make sure you check out MasonicCon Kansas and the South Pasadena MasonicCon event happening in July and August respectively. Thanks to our contributors, fellows, legacy partners, and producers for assisting us in making this happen. If you are curious about how you can help the podcast, head on over to WCYpodcast.com, click on support the show and see how you can help. That's all. We'll talk to you all next week. Until then, stay on the level for Whence Came You. I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, brother, Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
WCY Media. That's it. Okay, girl.